it's nice. So yes, I'm going to talk about generating sets for symplectic capacities. And um, this is actually joint work with my former PhD student, Dusan Yoksimovic. Um, so first I'm going to start with a question which will look unrelated to symplectic geometry. Um, then I'm going to see, I understand that this is a colloquium. So uh, I will give you some idea of what symplectic geometry is and explain what the symplectic manifold is. Uh, of course, I will explain what the symplectic capacity is. So that's the next step here. By the way, can everybody see my slide? If not, then please tell me. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the main question which I'm addressing in this joint work with uh, Dushan, namely, um, you know, what can you say about sets of capacities which generate all the others? And then there are going to be three more topics. So don't be scared. I, I'm going to say only a few things about the last three topics. So let's start with a question. Here it is. Um, namely, does there exist a positive real number x so that for every algebraic real number a not equal to zero, the power x to the a is not algebraic? Um, maybe you wouldn't have expected this from me. And you wonder what this has to do with symplectic geometry. And the answer is nothing. However, um, the proof of you know, the answer to this question is going to be related to the proof of the main result I'm talking about today. And uh, you might, may also wonder how difficult this question is. Um, at some point, I suggested to have this as a math Olympiad question. So you can do it now and tell me your answer in a few minutes or so. Uh, the proof I'm going to present is five lines or so. Now let's start with actual symplectic geometry. So what's symplectic geometry? So the short answer is symplectic geometry is the study of symplectic manifolds and maps between symplectic manifolds which preserve the symplectic structures. So I should explain to you what a symplectic manifold is. So let's do that. So symplectic manifold is a manifold together with a symplectic form. So that means I should also maybe start by explaining what a manifold is. Um, so the short answer to that is a manifold is space which looks, locally looks like coordinate space. So in one dimension, it would look like a line, in two, like a plane, and in three, like the usual space we live in, and so on. Um, and then a symplectic form is a closed and non-degenerate two-form on a manifold. So I should review what the two-form is. And I will also give you a picture of a symplectic form. This is how a symplectic form looks like. So a two-form is a collection of uh, bilinear maps, one for each point in your manifold. So the point is called x. And the bilinear map is a bilinear map from the tangent space to the manifold times itself to uh, the, the real numbers. And this map should be uh, skew symmetric. So it, when you intertwine the two vectors, it, you should get a minus sign. Such a thing is called a differential two form. And now I should tell you what closeness means. So for that, I write my two form as a sum like this, where you know xi or x1 up to x n, let's say, are the coordinates. I, I choose local coordinates on my manifold. And then dxi is the differential or derivative of that coordinate function. So uh, yeah, in some courses, this is also called the total derivative. <laughs> OK, so I have um, here, I have, see, when I take the total derivative, I get a one form, which means I can plug in a vector at each point, and I get a number. And then I should explain to you very briefly what the wedge product here does. So if you take two one forms, then this is a formula for what the wedge product does. Um, if you have three of them, then there's a similar formula. Now, if I write my two form like this, where omega ij are 
functions on the manifold, so locally, they're only defined locally, then I can express the exterior derivative d omega like this. Basically, it's defined by the Leibniz rule um, involving some wedge products here. And I want this to be zero, this exterior product. So that's what closeness means. Please ask questions if you have questions. So that explains the closeness part here. And now I should tell you what non-degeneracy means. Um, for this, uh, I take any vector v in my in a tangent space at some point x. And then non-degeneracy means that if the form vanishes when I plug in this vector and any other vector which is tangent to my manifold, then the vector v should be zero. So in some sense, this means maximally non-degenerate or maximally interesting, maximally non-trivial. Um, so the standard example is R to N with the standard symplectic form given by this sum of wedge products, where I label the standard coordinates in R to N by Q1, P1. The reason for this is that if you label them like this, then you have a simple formula for this standard symplectic form. And one result which you learn in an elementary course on symplectic geometry is that locally every symplectic manifold looks like this, like this standard symplectic manifold. Um, a more interesting example is the two sphere with this form here. Right? Here I take the dot product or interior, pro uh, sorry, the in the product, the standard in the product on R3. And here I take the cross product. So in this picture, that will be the example in this picture. Here you have S2 and you have a symplectic formula. Um, then there's a, a very important example which comes up in physics and classical mechanics, namely the canonical symplectic form on the cotangent bundle of any manifold. It carries a canonical symplectic. So this cotangent bundle carries a canonical symplectic structure or form. And of course, um, there's a relation to uh, algebraic geometry, namely through Cayley manifolds. So a Cayley manifold is a symplectic manifold together with a complex structure which is compatible with the symplectic form in a certain way. And an example of such a manifold is CPN, the complex projective space. Now, um, as I alluded to, Symplectic geometry has to do with classical mechanics, namely it comes from classical mechanics. Uh, in classical mechanics, the motion of a mechanical system can be described by Hamilton's equation. And this equation involves the canonical symplectic form on the cotangent bundle of configuration space. So the base is configuration space. That's the space of all um, generalized positions of your system. And the cotangent bundle plays the role of phase space, which consists of configuration space and also it also contains the generalized momenta. Now, um, you know, symplectic geometry is a bit analogous to Riemannian geometry. So a Riemannian manifold is a manifold together with uh, an inner product on each tangent space. Now, uh, an inner product is in particular symmetric and symplectic forms are skew-symmetric. And so this is an analogy. And, um, you know, the closeness condition for symplectic form can be, or would be analogous to the flat, to flatness of the Riemannian metric. And then in fact, uh, flat Riemannian manifolds of a fixed dimension also all, all look the same locally. So you have a similar result like for uh, symplectic forms, which all look locally like this standard form. So there is some similarity. However, um, Riemannian geometry really is really different. It differs a lot from symplectic geometry. For example, you can look at the group of structure preserving diffeomorphisms. So if you do this in the symplectic world, then if you do it in the Riemannian world, then the structure preserving diffeomorphisms are isometries. And the group of isometries is finite dimensional. It's a, in a canonical way, a finite dimensional Lie group. Um, if you have a closed manifold, so compact without boundary, then this Lie group is compact. But if you do 
uh, structure preserving diffeomorphisms for symplectic geometry, then this is always an infinite dimensional manifold or an infinite dimensional Lie group in a certain sense. Uh, except if you have a trivial case, when, when you take uh, a zero dimensional symplectic manifold, then it's not. So Riemann geometry and symplectic geometry are different. Now let's talk about a question, a symplectic question. Um, and let's be modest. So the goal is to understand all symplectic manifolds. Uh, and how should we possibly try to do this? Well, the approach is, or one approach is to understand the real valued functions on the class of symplectic manifolds. And maybe you should restrict to certain natural real valued functions. They're going to be called symplectic capacities. So that's what my talk will be about. Um, good, so let's tell you what the symplectic capacity is. So I denote by sip n the symplectic manifolds of, or the set, no, it's not a set, the class of symplectic manifolds of dimension 2n. Then a generalized symplectic capacity is a map from sip n to zero infinity. So it takes on positive real values or zero or infinity, and it's monotone and conformal. So monotonicity means that whenever you have a symplectic embedding, of one symplectic manifold into another one, then the capacity of the first one is at most that one of the second one. A symplectic embedding is a smooth embedding which pulls back the second form to the first form. It intertwines the two symplectic forms. And then there's a second condition in the conformality, which says that when you multiply your symplectic form by a positive constant, then the capacity should rescale by the same constant. Okay, so that's what a capacity is. Um, here's an example. So whenever you have any symplectic manifold and omega, you can define a capacity by this formula here. So it measures how big a copy of your symplectic manifold um, of, the, of the fixed symplectic manifold and omega embeds into your given symplectic manifold. Uh, I will use this example later. Now, um, yeah, there's a certain procedure how to produce new capacities once you have some capacities. Namely, you can combine them using a positively one homogeneous and monotone function. So by that, I mean, by positively one homogeneous, I mean that, you know, when you multiply uh, the whole tuple here of, of, uh, of, of variables by some positive uh, scalar, then you should be able to pull out that scalar out of F. And monotone means monotone in each variable. So when you have such a function and you compose it with some capacity C1 up to Cl, you will get a new capacity. As an example, you can take uh, the maximum as f or the minimum, but you can also do something a bit more interesting involving some root here. If you take p equals one and a i equals one over l, then you will get the arithmetic mean here. But you can also do the harmonic mean if you take p equals minus one and a i equals one over l, and you can do a similar formula which gives you the geometric mean. So there are a lot of ways of producing new capacities out of old ones. Um, now, when, when you, if you can produce all, uh, if, if you have a set of capacities and you can produce all other capacities via such combinations and also by taking pointwise limits, then I say that the set of capacities limit generates the whole class of uh, the whole set of capacities. So this is the definition. So a set of capacities is limit gener generating if every capacity is the pointwise limit of finite homogeneous monotone combinations of capacities. Um, by the way, maybe before I go on, I wanted to mention 
one thing about capacities, namely, see, philosophically speaking, uh, you can view the set of capacities as the dual space to the class of all symplectic manifolds. You know, there's a general scheme, I think, in math that you look at maps from the space you want to understand, then we hear it's the class of all symplectic manifolds, and you look at the set of, or yeah, maybe in general it will not be set, but let's say the set of maps from this class or this space to the real numbers. So the set of real value functions. And then they should have some properties, like here capacities have some properties. So this set you can somehow view as the dual of the class of all capacities. And in some settings, the dual tells you a lot about your actual space. So for example, in function analysis, when you take the dual of a non vector space, if you do this twice, then you can embed your non vector space into the dual of the dual of the non vector space. And you can use that, for example, to define uh, uh, the, uh, cl the closure of a non vector space. So you can use that to complete or complete the completion, I should say. You can use that to complete your non vector space, for example. So, so this is a bit the idea behind capacities that you can, uh, if you understand the space of good maps on your space, then you understand maybe the space. Okay, and then, you know, once you uh, talk about the space of good maps, then you may maybe want to understand that by looking at generating a generating set for this space. And that's what this definition in captures. So I want to uh, understand sets of capacities which generate all the others. Okay, now here's a question or a problem. Uh, by Hofer and others from some 15 years ago, namely find a minimal limit generating set of symplectic capacities. And minimal here means that whenever you have another uh, limit generate, if, sorry, whenever you have a subset of this set, then it does no longer limit generate all symplectic capacities. Um, actually, they also wondered about a variation of this question where um, you only take the minimum or maximum of your capacities, right? So you take, uh, that way you again can take a sequence of combinations of capacities, but you only combine with minima and maxima. And then you look at the limit of such a sequence, pointless limit. Um, now, in particular, you can wonder whether there is a countable uh, limit min max generating set of capacities. So this question, uh, so the problem and the question are both completely open, except for a result by McDuff about ellipsoids in dimension four. Uh, or actually more precisely, um, they were completely open. Fabian, can I ask a question? Yes. About it's actually about the previous slide. So you said something about this dual space. So so if you have two symplectic manifolds, and all of the capacities take the same value on it, can you then say something about how they're related? Uh, yeah, that's going to be my last question. Oh, it's the recognition problem. <laughs> so so you would like to say that then the two symplectic manifolds are isomorphic, right? That's called recognition, object recognition, I would call it. Another word for it is that, or another way of saying this is that the capacities form a complete invariant. And um, okay, I can tell you what I know about this. It's a future project, future PhD project. <laughs> I have some ideas how to, um, how, how, you know, I have a setting in mind in which this should be true. So I don't know how to do this for all symplectic manifolds, but for a certain subcategory of the class of symplectic manifolds, I think I know how to do it. How to prove that in fact, the capacities are complete in value. So there's some evidence for this, okay. Uh, yeah, I also have a method, but let, let's maybe not jump too much ahead. But this is not a finished project in any case. Um, and by the way, I also want to mention that this is also a question by Hofer and others, the question you just asked about recognition of objects or having a complete invariant. Um, now, let's come back to the problem I'm looking at here, namely whether uh, there is a countable limit 
min max generating set. So in the sense that you only take minima and maxima of capacities and then you take uh, the pointwise limit of such combinations. So it's the recountable set which generates all the others in this way. And as I said, the problem was completely open. Now uh, you have some time to guess the answer since it's no longer open. So it's either yes or no. So it's, is there such a countable set, generating set? And the answer is no. In fact, uh, it's much worse. So, you know, every limit min max generating set has cardinality even larger than the real numbers. Just, so not just uncountable, but larger than real numbers. And this is true for a weak notion of generating. We don't need limit min max generating. Um, so this was the main result, one of the two main results of the PhD thesis of my former PhD student, Dushan Yoksimovic. And we wrote an article about this, which we uh, submitted. So here is this main result. Actually, it's a corollary to the main result. So it says that every countably Borel generating set of symplectic capacities as cardinality is strictly bigger than the real numbers. By the way, this cardinality is called bet one. For some time, I thought it was called aleph one, but it's not, it's called bet. This is the second letter in the, in the Hebrew alpha, alphabet. And this is the reason why you learn it, or the, the occasion to learn it, let's say. And this is true if uh, we are in dimension at least four, so n is at least two. Now I should explain what countably Borel generating means. So it means that we allow for any Borel measurable combination of countably many of those capacities in this generating set. Uh, so, okay, I should remind you what a Borel measurable function is. So when you have two topological spaces, then, or actually if you have just one topological space, the Borel sigma algebra is the smallest sigma algebra containing the topology. And a uh, function between two topological spaces is called Borel measurable if the pre image of any Borel set is Borel. Now, being a Borel set is an extremely weak condition. So it's hard to write down any set which is not Borel. And you can do that, and then you can, you can do it explicitly, but then you have to use the axiom of choice to prove that it's not Borel. At least that's the only way I know. So it's a tricky business. So in, in practice, every set is Borel. And every function is Borel measurable in practice. Um, in particular, I mean, what is literally true, literally true is that every continuous function is Borel measurable, but also the maximum and minimum. Actually, uh, pointwise limits of Borel, Borel measurable functions are again Borel measurable. So that's what we allow here. So we allow combining functions which are Borel measurable. Um, and we do not just restrict ourselves to finite combinations of uh, capacities, we allow for countable combinations. So we take countably many capacities and we combine them with a parallel function. And then we get, we don't necessarily get a new capacity, but we don't care. We just care that every capacity is uh, given by such an expression. Okay. Sometimes we don't get the capacity, but every capacity should be expressible in this way. And then we say that our set Borel or countably Borel generates. Um, so this is a, a weaker notion than the notions we had before. So the, the limit min max generating uh, notion is stronger. Okay, so that means that uh, our result in particular says that every limit min max generating set of symplectic capacities has cardinality strictly bigger than the, than the real numbers. So it answers this question here. Um, but it's also, you know, this Borel generating notion is also weaker than the notion uh, of limit generating where you allow for any finite combination, um, which, you know, now we assume to be Borel. So if you, if you add this word Borel, then actually that's also, the, you know, this, this counter Borel generating or generation is a weaker notion than the thing about limit generation, if you add Borel there. Okay, um, any questions? 
And I wanted to add something. So what's the something I wanted to add? Yeah, so what I wanted to say is, you know, this result here diminishes the hope of finding a manageable generating system of capacities. So this big goal of understanding the dual space of the class of symplectic manifolds was maybe a bit too big. Okay. Um, now, let me talk about the proof of this result. So it follows from what is the main result of the PG thesis, or one of the two main results of the PG thesis of Dusha and Yuximwich. So uh, it has two parts. The first part says that the set of all capacities has cardinality bet two. So that's the cardinality of the power set of the real numbers, if you have at least dimension four. And the second part says whenever you have a set of functions which take values in this uh, interval zero infinity and the set has cardinality at most bet one, then the set it countably Borel generates has also cardinality at most bet one. And this is a very general result. Uh, as you can see, it has nothing to do with symplectic geometry and it's actually elementary to prove. So what you use here is the fact that when you have a separable topological space, then the Borel sigma algebra has cardinality at most bet one. And that you prove by using transfinite induction. So the second part is, is elementary. And the first part um, is the interesting part. So let me talk, uh, before I talk about that, how to prove that, I want to also, um, you know, maybe point out that how to, how to get the corollary? Well, okay, say, say we have a set which countably Borel generates all symplectic capacities. Um, well, this set, see here in, in my theorem, I'm going to take S to be the class of all symplectic manifolds. And that's not really a set, but you know, never mind. I can instead look at the set of isomorphism classes of symplectic manifolds, and it also works. But morally speaking, I take the class of all symplectic manifolds. And then, uh, you know, the subset I'm looking at here is my given set of capacities, which supposedly generates. But if it has cardinality less than that one, then it uh, does not generate my whole set of capacities because that has, capac has, has a cardinality bet two, and they only generate something of cardinality at most bet one, right? So I don't generate everything. I need to have cardinality for this subset. I need to have cardinality strictly bigger than bet one. Um, good. So um, now, so actually, maybe I should point out one more thing. See, morally speaking, this means that I need as many capacities to generate all capacities as there are capacities, namely by two. Uh, and what does morally mean? Morally means this statement is compatible or consistent with Tamilo Frankovich's choice. And uh, I don't want to go into details here. <laughs> okay. So, so we don't gain anything by this notion of generation. We need as many uh, capacities as the thing we want to generate, morally speaking. Now let's talk about the proof of this statement that the set of capacities has cardinality bet two. There's some geometry going on, so that's something I want to explain. Um, so the idea of proof, well, we want to show that you know the set of capacities has at least this cardinality. The other uh, inequality is easy to prove, but this one is the interesting one. So for this, I will write down some set of capacities of cardinality bet two. So here it is, namely for each subset A of the interval zero one, I define a capacity CA by this formula here. So remember this was the embedding capacity we had before. It measures how big a copy of my symplectic manifold MA embeds into the given symplectic manifold. And the manifold MA is this thing here, a shell. So I take, a, a closed ball in R2N 
and I take the complement with a smaller open ball. And the smaller open ball has radius one. And this shell has a width, which is the difference of the two radii. I call it A. Okay, then I get some symplectic manifold. It comes with the standard symplectic form on R to N. And then I do the supremum uh, of all these embedding capacities where I, I, I you know, this index A or the uh, variable A ranges over all elements of my given set A, my parameter set. So I, I get a capacity. And now I claim that when you take two different subsets of zero one, you will get two different capacities. And if that is true, then we have bet one, bet two capacities, right? Because you know the map taking uh, such a subset of zero one and mapping it to the corresponding capacity C A, this map is then injective. So the number of capacities of this form is at least the cardinality of this uh, power set of the interval zero one, and that's bet two. Now, the question is, why is this true? And actually, this is not literally true. We have to modify this construction by taking this, the disjoint union of two shells, but let's not worry about that, okay? So let me explain the idea why this should be true here, why different A's give rise to different capacities. So here is a picture for this. So um, what we do is, so before the picture, I should maybe say what we do. Um, See, if you have two subsets, parameter sets A and B, which are not equal, then one contains a number which the other one doesn't. And let's say A contains a number A not, which is not contained in B. Then I look at the corresponding shell, this blue shell here. And I look at its capacity with respect to this A and with respect to the B, right? And I want to get two different numbers. That's what's going to happen. And why is that? See, if I take CA of this blue shell, then I get something at least one, which is at least one because I have this embedding capacity here with A equals A naught, and that gives me one. But if I do the red, if I, well, I shouldn't say red, if I do uh, CB for this capital B of this shell here, then I claim I always, I get something which is less than one. And why is that? Because see, if I take a, a parameter B in capital B, let's say B is bigger than A naught, then this embedding capacity here tells me how big a shell of width B I can embed into the shell of width A naught. So you could, for example, just try to take the identity map, but unfortunately the shell uh, the blue shell was smaller than the red one, so I cannot take the identity because then I have some part of the red shell which falls outside of the blue shell. So I can actually, you know, well, we don't have to actually embed the red shell, right? We, we can shrink it. When you remember the embedding capacity here, we are allowed to shrink our uh, domain here. So that's what we try to do. However, even if we shrink the red shell, we can still not symplectically embed it into the blue shell in this way here. And the reason for this is called helicity, <laughs> which I don't want to go into details but about, but uh, you know, helicity takes an exact two form on an oriented uh, 2n minus one dimensional manifold, and it gives you a real number. And the manifold should be closed without boundary. For example, you know, you can take an exact two form in S3 or any three dimensional manifold or a five dimensional manifold and should be oriented. And also uh, this, um, the dimension of that manifold should at least be three, otherwise it doesn't work. So there's a natural way of getting a, a real number out of a two for, an exact two form in such a manifold. And uh, then there is a Stokes' theorem for helicity. And Stokes' theorem tells me that this symplectic embedding here cannot happen this way. Okay, but maybe I can embed the red shell, shell in a different way into my blue shell. And yes, you can, maybe like this. Here, uh, you know, this inner boundary of the red shell does not wrap around the inner boundary of the blue shell. That's the difference. 
Um, however, in order to embed the red shell in this way, you need to shrink it a lot. And the reason for this is that in the image, you will have a hole. You can see here a hole here. Um, and this hole has a certain volume, which is going to be the same fraction of the, you know, if you compare with the volume of the red image, it's going to be the same ratio like the hole here and the red part here. And that's again because of helicity. So it takes away a certain volume. And therefore, you have to shrink this red shell by, uh, uh, you know, by a lot, let's say by factor two at least. And that will tell you that this supremum, even if you take the supremum over all Bs in B, and then you do C, B, I mean, this, this thing here of, of the blue shell, you will get at most one half, let's say. And that's less than one, which is equal to CA of the blue shell. So the two capacities, CA and CB, are different when you apply them to the blue shell. So that's the reason why uh, we get two different capacities here, and therefore we get bet two capacities via this construction. So this proves this theorem up to details, of course. Now, uh, any questions? So let's summarize. So the, the problem by Hofer and others was to find the minimal limit mean max generating set of symplectic capacities. And uh, together with Dushan Yoksimovich, I proved that, you know, Every countably Borel generating set of symplectic capacities has cardinality bigger than that one, which is the cardinality of the real numbers. And this follows from this theorem, which tells you the uh, cardinality of the set of capacities. And also something about generation or Borel generation. And what we use in the end of the day is that the subset, a subset of lower cardinality of some set is not the whole set. Okay, now let's go back to the math Olympiad question. Does there exist a positive real number so that for every algebraic number not equal to zero, the power x to the a is not algebraic? You have, again, some chance to guess. So what's the answer? It's not always no, by the way. Mostly it's no when I ask questions like this, but now it's yes. And here's the proof. Um, sketch of a proof. So we look at a function which takes two algebraic numbers a and b and gives you um, b to the one over a. And you have to take out some numbers so it makes sense. Okay. So you know the domain of this function is countable and the image or the sorry the target is uncountable. So the function is not surjective. And now you take any x in the complement of the image of f, and it has the desired property. I'm not sure if I should explain that. <laughs> anyway, let me try very briefly why x in the complement has the desired property. Um, so see, if you take this x to an algebraic number a, then the b you get is not algebraic because if it was algebraic, then b to the one over a is my x and that would be in the image of f. So the moral is sometimes you don't have to understand much or any, anything deep about the structure of the objects you're looking at, like, like the capacities. It's enough to count them. That's the common feature here. Any questions? So um, I have some more questions. So one is about representation of capacities. Um, so for that, let's define another capacity which we associate with a symplectic manifold m omega. It's a bit like the one you already saw, but this one is called target embedding capacity and now it has an upper index here. Um, okay, here's a formula for it. So it measures how much we have to shrink the, this given capacity and sorry, this given symplectic manifold m omega so that the 
well, or the fixed symplectic manifold, so that the given symplectic manifold embeds into this shrunk version. So how much we can actually shrink it, okay? So we take an EVMO, so it tells us how much we can shrink so that it still embeds the given symplectic manifold. Now we call uh, capacity connectedly target representable if there exists a connected symplectic manifold so that the capacity equals this capacity here. Um, so Hofer and others uh, asked in the same paper, they, uh, they asked which capacities are connectedly target representable. Uh, in particular, you can wonder whether every capacity is connected to target representable. And you can again guess. Um, and if you remember the main theorem, then it's maybe not so hard to guess. Anyway, the answer is no. No, wait, wait, wait. I don't want to tell you the answer. I first want to tell you that it was completely open until now, and now I tell you the answer. So the answer is no. And uh, it stays no even if you forget about connected. Okay. Um, so that's also corollary to, corollary to the main result, which I talked about, namely the corollary says almost no capacity is target representable. Here's the proof. So, um, well, so the set of isomorphism classes of symplectic manifolds has cardinality bet one. That's easy. It uses the Whitney embedding theorem in the end of the day. And then, you know, by the first part of the theorem, the set of capacities has cardinality bet two. And therefore, uh, we get this corollary B, you know, because the set of target representable capacities is the image of the map which takes an isomorphism class of a symplectic manifold and gives you the corresponding target embedding capacity. And that image has cardinality at most bet one, right? And by almost no, I mean that the cardinality of those which are representable is lower than the cardinality of all of them. Any questions? Well, I, I have another question. It's about continuity of capacities. Namely, you can also wonder whether every normalized symplectic capacity is continuous. Uh, now, normalized means that, uh, you know, the capacity of the unit fold in R to N is pi, and the same holds for the so-called unit cylinder. Let's not worry about that is. There is a, a, a symplectic cylinder. We can also ask the same question without normalized. Uh, so uh, now I have a question. So uh, maybe, uh, yeah, guess who asked this question? Here's the answer. Um, and the answer to the question is no. <laughs> um, and uh, this is a result um, I proved with another co-author, Kaitzenisch, some years ago. Namely, you know, this follows from the fact that the spherical capacity in dimension at least four is discontinuous. Oh, by the way, I should, I don't know if I want to tell you what continuity means. Let's make it short. See, let's say we have, a, so we, we look at the compact manifold with boundary, let's say. And then continuity means continuity with respect to the C infinity topology. So the, the set of capacities, you know, is a subset of all forms, of all two forms. There's a C infinity topology on that, and that's what we mean. And if you do this with the so-called spherical capacity, then it happens to be discontinuous. Uh, this spherical capacity measures how big a sphere uh, S to n minus one embeds into a symplectic manifold in a pre-symplectic way, which means that the symplectic form is pulled back to a certain pre-symplectic form of the sphere, which is the pullback of the standard symplectic form of R to n to the sphere. It's a two form still, it's no longer symplectic, but it's still a two form. And you want to obtain that when you, via your embedding. Okay, so it's a bit similar to the domain embedding capacity I talked about, but we do a bit a different thing. Uh, actually, you can also do a similar thing with shells. So, you know, the 
shell capacity I showed you before, this CMA is also discontinuous. Uh, the proof of this is based on helicity, and that's why I mentioned it here. So it, it's based on the same method uh, as the proof of the main result I talked about. Um, and actually, this result has been extended to a equivariant setting by Fidali and others recently. Okay, so that's basically all I wanted to say, except that I wanted to uh, come back to the question by Alvaro. <laughs> Then we do the symplectic capacities recognize objects. So that means if you have two symplectic manifolds, which have the same capacities, are the symplectic manifolds isomorphic? So is there a diffeomorphism which intertwines the two symplectic forms? And uh, this is again widely open. And uh, I have some ideas how to prove that it's true in a certain setting. As I mentioned, um, you know, you can look at a sub or subcategories of the category of all symplectic manifolds. Uh, the morphisms are the embeddings, symplectic embeddings. You can actually also allow for less morphisms. Sometimes people do this, and then you can look at such a subcategory, and you can look at capacities on the subcategory of the whole category of all symplectic manifolds. And then if you take the right subcategory, then I think I know how to prove that capacities do recognize objects. So that means that we have a complete invariant. Um, and the idea here is again, helicity. Good, so that's all I wanted to say. <laughs>